Hi, hello there. Welcome to supporting hard disk and other storage devices. Okay, so the objectives of this video lecture. So at the end of this video lecture, you should be able to discuss technologies inside a hard drive and how a computer communicates with a hard drive. Okay, so install and support hard drive identify tape drives and tape cartridges support optical drives and flash memory devices and troubleshoot hard drives okay so let's start so for the hard disk drive technologies and interface standards okay so basically an hdd or hard disk drive sizes includes 1.8 inches ssd 2.5 inches SSD and you've got the 2.5 hard disk drive okay so basically for 2.5 hard disk drive or 2.5 size it is intended for laptop computers okay so for 3.5 size of that that is for desktops and you also have 1.8 okay so size for low-end laptops and other equipments Okay, so next would be the SSD or the solid state drive, okay, or solid state devices. Okay, so the difference or one of the big difference of this with our traditional hard disk is that there is no moving parts on the SSD. Okay, so we don't have motors, we don't have mechanical um, components inside this SSD hard drives. Okay, so built using a non-volatile flash memory stored on an EEPROM or electronically erasable programmable read-only memory chips. So memory in an SSD is called NAND flash memory. So lifespan is based on the number of write operations on the drive and expensive technology. Okay, so but faster, more reliable, last longer and use less power than the traditional magnetic drives okay so how about the magnetic drives so one two or more platters or discs okay so stuck together spinning in unison inside a sealed metal housing okay so basically this is how it looked like externally but when you open it so you've got a vacuum shield okay You've got the platters here, the spindle, okay, the motors, and so on. Okay, so firmware controls data reading, writing, and motherboard communications. So you've got read-write heads are controlled by the actuator. So data is organized in concentric circles called tracks. So tracks are basically divided into segments called sectors. Okay. So most current drives use 4,096-byte sectors. So hybrid hard disk drives use both technologies and operating system must support it. Okay. Now, these are the technologies used inside the hard drive. Okay. So basically, you'll have here the 1.8. Okay. Solid state drive. You've got inside an SSD drive, and you also have the 2.5 solid state drive. Okay, so nowadays this replaces the traditional magnetic drives. Okay, now inside the magnetic hard disk, so basically we have here an actuator. So, actuator is a device which moves head arm assembly. Okay, so its task is not only to start and secure continuous movement of hard disk okay or hard disk head assembly okay but it also fully uh, fully control it okay so securing and control of this movement is a crucial importance for performing elementary functions of hard drives okay so also you've got here the uh, spindle okay or drive spindle so the spindle keeps the platters in position and rotates them as required. So the revolutions per minute or RPM rating determines how fast data can be written to and from the hard drive. 
So a typical internal disk drives, okay, so for desktop drives runs at 7,200 revolution per minute. Two faster and slower speeds are available, okay. So we also have uh, 5,400 revolution per minute, okay, and we had uh, 10,000 revolution per minute also, okay. So the spindle keeps the platters at fixed distance apart from each other to enable the read and write arm to gain access. Okay. So the next component is this uh, platter here. So the platters are circular, uh, circular disks inside the hard drive where uh, the ones and zeros that make up your files are stored. Okay, so it's in here. Okay, so this platter rotates at 10,000 revolution per minute or 7,000 revolution per minute, or even you have 5,400 revolution per minute. So these are made up of uh, aluminum, glass, or ceramic, and have a magnetic surface in order to permanently store data. So on a larger hard drives, several platters are used to increase the overall capacity of the drive. So data is stored on the platters in trucks sectors and cylinders to keep it organized and easier to find okay so you also have the read write head there okay or the read write arm as they call it so that read write arm or head controls the movement of the read write heads okay which do the actual reading and writing on the desk so the arm makes sure that the heads are in a right position based on the data that needs to be accessed or written. So it's also known as the head arm or simply the actuator arm. So there is typically one read write head for every platter side. So which floats 3 to 20 millionths of an inch above the platter surface. All right. Okay. So also this platter is basically divided into trucks, cylinders, and sectors. Okay, so a truck is that portion of the disc which passes under a single stationary head during disc rotation. Okay, a ring one bit wide. Right. So a cylinder, not shown here. Okay, is comprised of a set of trucks described by all the heads on a separate platters at a single sick position. So each cylinder is equidistant from the center of the disc. Okay, so a truck is divided into segments of sectors. Okay, and this is the basic unit of storage here. Okay, so also on your hard disk, we can perform low level formatting or the high level formatting but what's the difference between the two okay so the sector markings are written to the hard drive at the factory so not the same as high level formatting performed for an operating system installation okay so basically a high level formatting can be performed on a hard disk only after the sectors and tracks have been formatted using a low level format okay so this type of formatting is where actual data like the operating system is written onto the disk sector or drive sector to create file and system structures so you can use the drive to install other applications and store data and files okay so for instance if you have an existing drive but you want to format it before upgrading the operating system you would run a high level format so basically high level formatting is the type of formatting that we do on the hard drive okay so the format operation overrides the existing data structures on the drive and creates new ones so like a new boot sector data structures on the drive and it is there formatting is used okay so that is whenever you create new partitions on a hard drive and you want to format them in order to be able to use them to install apps or store data okay now when you say low level okay low level formatting is used to initiate a hard drive and prepare it for data by creating the actual sectors and tracks on the drive as well as 
the control structure needed to read and write data on the drive. So a low-level format is often completed by the manufacturer of the hard drive. So for instance, in cases where you purchase new hard drives to install into an existing computer. So in some cases, however, you may need to run a low-level format after installing the hard drive into the computer before you can install an actual operating system. So after a drive has a low-level format run on it for the first time, this is the only time the drive will actually contain no data. So later, if a low-level format is run on a drive within existing it, okay, so it is erased and lost forever. So basically, a low-level format resets the drive to each original out-of-the-box state. Okay? So another thing, low-level formatting could require specialized software and does not take much longer time to complete. Okay? So it is for this reason, it is recommended to have a professional data recovery and formatting business perform any low-level formatting unit. So as a data check is also performed afterwards to ensure that there is no remaining data that could be recovered. Okay, so basically again, when we say formatting, okay, so the type of formatting that we do on our hard drive is a high level formatting. All right. So next is firmware. Okay, you've got the UEFI BIOS and OS that use logical block addressing or LBA to address all hard drive sectors. So size of each sector plus the total number of sectors determine capacity. Okay, so some hard disks are using this self-monitoring analysis and reporting technology. This is used to predict when a drive is likely to fail. Okay, so you're gonna have some sort of warning before your disks failed. All right, next. So what are the interfaces used by our hard drive? So right now, so we are using, or most of us are using SATA cable. So all current hard drives use serial ATA or SATA interface standards to connect to the motherboard. Okay. So external SATA or eSATA, firewire or USB are also being used to interconnect if we are using the external hard drive. Okay. So take note that we have several types of disconnector. Okay. So firewire is in here. Okay. So you've got a four pin, six pins, and nine pins firewall. Okay. You've got SATA here and eSATA, which is usually used for external uh, storage. All right. Now for the USB, we have several types. All right. So we've got type A, type B, mini USB, micro USB. Also, it comes with different um, versions like version one, two, or Next, so interface standards define data speeds and transfer method with the computer system. So it also define types of cables and connectors here. Okay, so you've got the eSATA connector and the cable used to connect to it. You've got the internal SATA. Okay, so when you say SATA alone, that pertains to internal. Okay, so this is how it looked like. And of course, you've got the SATA cable. So it was developed by the Serial ATA International Organization or the SATA IO. So it has an oversight of T13 committees. All right. So next, your SATA standards, okay, so has different sort of uh, revisions. Okay. So SATA revision, okay, revision one. It has a data transfer rate of 1.5 gigabits per second and no latch pins easily bent. Okay, so I'll have this one. And then they come with, or they came with SATA revision 2, okay, which has a 3 gigabit per second latching and then it's a revised port. Okay, and the last one would be. SATA revision 3.x, which has 6 gigabit per second data transfer rate, 
which is similar to revision 2. Okay, when it comes to um, pins or connectors. All right, so for this serial ATA, so which are being used to connect our hard disk, okay, to our motherboard. Okay, so we are using, of course, a SATA cable to it. And this supports hot swapping, okay, or hot plugging. So when you say hot swap or hot plug, reconnect and disconnect drive while the system is running okay so connects to one internal sata connector on the motherboard via this seven pin sata cable okay also it uses a 15 pin sata power connector so basically you've got a sata power cable and a sata power or a sata data cable okay so your motherboard might have more SATA connectors okay so like what we have here we have six SATA connectors so the more the more devices that you can connect to it so this is how it looked like at the back of the hard disk you've got the SATA, uh, SATA connector or SATA power connector and you've got the SATA data cable connector okay so next so motherboard or expansion card can provide external SATA or eSATA ports for external drives okay so external SATA or eSATA drives use special external shielded serial ATA cable of up to two meters long okay so what are the purchasing considerations so SATA standards for the drive and motherboard need to match for optimum speed so if no match system runs at slower speed okay so USB and FireWire have been huge boon to external storage. Okay, so still the performance of these uh, storage devices compared to desktop drives has always lagged. So with the development of the serial ATA or SATA standards, a new external storage format, okay, so external serial ATA or eSATA has entered the marketplace. Okay. So eSATA is an industry standard for controlling various hardware used to connect external storage devices. So it competes with some firewire and USB standards to provide faster data transfer speeds between hardware devices. So maybe you are wondering, okay, so what's the difference between this USB, we got the external SATA and the firewire, okay? Now, how does eSATA compare with USB and FireWire? So both USB and FireWire interfaces are high-speed serial interfaces between computer system and external peripherals. It could be a hard disk also, okay? So USB is more general and used for wider range of peripherals such as keyboards, mice, scanners, and printers, right? And FireWire is almost exclusively used by an external storage interface. Okay. Next, so how to select and install hard drives. So topics covered, selecting a hard drive. How do we select our hard drive? Installation details for SATA drive. How to install hard drive in a bay too wide for drive. Okay, so we have some spacers and how to set up RAID system in our computer system. Okay, so let's start with selecting a hard drive. Okay, so hard drive must match OS and the motherboard. So you need to know what standards the motherboard or controller card providing the drive interface can use. So you, you, we need always to consult our documentation or the manual, user manual, for the board or the card okay so also you could check the uefi or bios if it uses an auto detection to prepare the device so drive capacity and configuration selected best possible standard becomes part of the configuration okay so considerations drive capacity so today's desktop hard drive ranges from one terabyte for ssd to more than six terabyte for magnetic okay so which one is yours okay another consideration is the spindle speed 
So most common is 7,200 revolution per minute. The higher the RPMs, the faster the drive interface standard. Okay, so you also have 10,000 revolution per minute. Okay, so next consideration is of course the interface standard. So use standards the motherboard supports. As always, so you need to check first the connector and the motherboard before purchasing or selecting a hard drive. So next would be a cache or buffer size. So ranges from 2 MB to 128 MB. So the higher, the better. Okay. Next, what are the steps to install a SATA drive? So a SATA drive might have jumpers. So you check it. Most likely set by factory as they should be. Okay. So some SATA drives have two power connectors, choose only one to use. So never install two power cords at the same time. All right. So next, may have to purchase controller card when the motherboard drives connecting are not functioning. Or if the motherboard does not support a fast SATA standard that your hard drive uses. Okay. So steps to install SATA drive. So first, know your starting point. So how is your system configured? Is everything working properly? So you need to write down what you know about the system. Okay, so documentation is very important. Second, read the documentation and prepare your work area. So read all installation instructions first, visualize all the steps and you need to protect yourselves against ESD and avoid working on a carpet. Okay. Now on step number two, read the documentation and prepare your work area. So you have to handle the drive carefully. Do not touch any exposed circuitry as your ESD or the static electricity in our body will transfer to it and it could damage the hardware or the circuitry. Okay. So prevent other people from touching exposed microchips. So drain static electricity from the package and from our body by touching metal for at least two seconds. So you have to look for a metal component on the work area and then touch that. Usually a doorknob can do. Okay. So next would be if you must set it down, place it, compo uh, place it component side up. Okay. Do not place the drive on the computer case or on a metal table. Okay, so step number three, install the hard drive, shut down the computer and unplug it. So before you work on your computer system, make sure it is not plugged in. Okay, and it should be turned off. All right, so decide which bay will hold the drive, slide the drive in the bay and secure it. Okay, so usually it uses two screws on both sides. Okay, so others are using sliders to pull the drive. Okay, and then you install it on the pin. Now use correct motherboard SATA connector. So connect a 15 pin SATA or 4 pin Molex power connector from the power supply to the drive. Okay, so check all connections and power up the system. So afterwards, you could go ahead and check on the UEFI BIO setup if the drive is recognized correctly. Okay, now you are ready to prepare the hard drive for the first use. So boot from Windows setup on DVD or if you are using the uh, USB drive, okay, so to boot your Windows, so you could go ahead and boot it. Okay, so boot your systems, okay, so from DVD or USB drive, and then follow the directions on the screen to install Windows on a new drive so basically some preparations that you can use here is of course you, you partition the hard drive by logically dividing it into several um, sections okay and then afterwards you need to format it we call it high level formatting okay so if installing a second hard drive with windows installed on the first drive use windows disk management utility to partition and format the second try.
Okay, so installing a drive in a removable bay. So unplug the cage, okay, fan from its power source. Turn handle on its locking device counterclockwise to remove it. So slide the bay to the front and out of the case. Insert hard drive in the bay. So use two screws on each side of the anchor or to anchor the drive in the bay. So slide the bay back into the case, reinstall the locking pins and plug in the case fan power cord. So installation of the hard drive would totally depend on the chassis or case that you're using. So some are using this removable bin, okay? Then you, you install the drive on it and then you bring, you bring back the bin to the chassis, okay? Okay, so this is an example of removable bay, okay? It has a fan in front and is anchored to the case or chassis with locking pins, okay? So some are using this type, install a hard drive in the bay using two screws on each side of the drive. So you need to pull out the entire assembly and then you install your drive in there and then bring it back to the chassis. Right. Okay, so use a universal bay kit to securely fit a small drive into the bay. So you have sort of spacer here. They call it the universal bay kit. Okay. Now the adapter spans the distance between the sides of the bay. Should you use a smaller size hard disk? Okay. Now, installation of the hard drive in a laptop. So general guidelines. First, you need to check the manufacturer's documentation or user manual for drive sizes and connector types. So be aware of voiding the manufacturer's warranty. So if it is still under warranty, so you better uh, bring your laptop to the nearest service stations. Okay. So considerations when shopping for a laptop drive. So laptop drive is 2.5 or 1.8 inches wide. So you may use SSD or the solid state devices. Okay. So hard drive connectors, usually it's SATA or PATA for older laptops. So if upgrading, may want to use USB to SATA converter. So both drives can be working and you can copy files from one to the other. Now, if you are working on the older laptop computers, okay, so that requires disassembly. So newer notebooks, easy to replace, okay? So if the UEFI BIOS setup contains or uses the auto detect, then system boots up and UEFI BIOS recognizes the new drive, a new drive, okay? So including the manufacturer, the capacity, okay? Searches for an operating system, so if a new drive, boot from Windows Recovery CD and install the OS. But then most of us, instead of using CD, we are now using a USB flash drive to install an operating system. Okay. So next would be setting up a hardware RAID. So RAID stands for Redundant Array of an Expensive Desk. Okay. So um, this is a way of storing the same data in different places on multiple hard disks or solid state drives to protect data in case of drive failure. So there are different RAID levels, however, and not all have the goal of providing redundancy. Okay. So maybe you are asking, why do we have to use RAID? Okay. So RAID, why use RAID? So to improve fault tolerance by writing two copies of it it's to a different uh, hard drive so we sort of we have a backup okay so to improve performance by writing data to two or more hardest drives so that a single drive is not excessively used okay but how RAID works okay so RAID works by placing data on multiple disks and allowing IO or input output operations to overlap in a balanced way so improving performance, okay? So because the use of multiple disks increases the mean time between failure or the MD, uh, MTBF, okay, mean time between failure, storing data redundantly also increases fault tolerance, 
Okay? So RAID arrays appear to the operating system as a single logical drive. So RAID employs the techniques of disk mirroring or disk stripping. Mirroring will copy identical data onto more than one drive. Stripping partitions help spread data over multiple disk drives. So each drive's storage capacity or space is divided into units ranging from sector, okay, so which is uh, 512 bytes up to several megabytes. So the stripes of all the disks are interleaved and addressed in order. Okay, so types of RAID. So we have several types. Let's discuss first spanning. So spanning, sometimes called JBOT or just a bunch of disks. Okay, so uses two hard drives to hold a single Windows volume. So when one drive is full, data is written to the second drive. Okay, now RAID 0 is the first level on the RAID. Okay, so this configuration has stripping, but no redundancy of data. So it offers best performance but it does not provide fault tolerance. Okay. Now with RAID 0, okay, so it uses two or more physical disks, writes to physical disks evenly across all disks so that no one disk receives all activity. So Windows call or calls it RAID 0 a stripped volume. Okay, so another term for RAID 0 is a stripped volume. So whatever is uh, written here, okay? So something like we will be using this as a whole, okay? So there is no redundancy on uh, RAID 0, okay? So it combines the capacity of the disk. That's RAID 0. All right. Next, you've got RAID 1 or mirroring, okay? So RAID 1 is also known as disk mirroring. This configuration consists of at least two drives that duplicate the storage of data. So there is no stripping. Read performance is improved since either disk can be read at the same time. So write performance is the same as for a single disk storage. Okay. So RAID 1 is mirroring. RAID 0 is stripping. All right? Next, we have RAID 5. RAID 5 uses three or more drives. So this level is based on parity block level stripping. So the parity information is stripped across each drive, enabling the array to function even if one drive were to fail. So the array's architecture allows read and write operations to span multiple drives resulting in performance better than that of a single drive, but not as high as that of RAID 0 array. So RAID 5 requires at least three disks, but it is often recommended to use at least five disks for performance reasons or for performance reasons. So RAID 5 arrays are generally considered to be a poor choice for use on write intensive system because of the performance impact associated with writing. Okay, so when a disk fails, it can take a long time to rebuild a RAID 5 array. Okay, so the next one is RAID 10, okay, pronounced as RAID 1 0. It's a combination of RAID 0 and RAID 1. Okay, so RAID 1 plus 0 combining RAID 1 and RAID 0. This level is often referred to as RAID 10, which offers higher performance than RAID 1, but at much higher cost. So in RAID 1 plus 0, the data is mirrored and the mirrors are stripped. All right. Okay. So from this illustration here, you've got the JBOD spanning. Okay. So again, JBOD is just a bunch of tasks generally refers to a collection of hard disks that have not been configured to act as a redundant array or an expensive disk array. Okay, so RAID 0 uses stripping, okay, or also known as a strip set or strip volume. 
So it basically sp uh, splits or strips data evenly across two or more disks at what, uh, as what you see here on the screen. So since RAID 0 provides no fault tolerance or redundancy, the failure of one drive will cause the entire array to fail as a result of having data stripped across all disks. So the failure will result in total data loss. Okay, so this configuration is typically implemented having speed as intended goal. So RAID 0 is normally used to increase performance, although it can be used also as a way to create large logical volume out of two or more physical disks. So combining the capacity of the physical disks. Okay, so RAID 1 here consists of an exact copy or mirror of a set of data on two or more disks. So a classic RAID 1 mirror pair contains two disks. So this configuration offers no parity, stripping, or spanning of disk space across multiple disks. Since data is mirrored on all disks belonging to the array, and the array can only be as big as the smallest member disk. So the layout is useful when read performance or reliability is more important than write performance or the resulting data storage capacity. All right, so next you've got RAID 5 there, parity checking. So it consists of block level stripping with distributed parity. Okay, so unlike in RAID 4, parity information is distributed among the drives. It requires that all drives but one be present to operate. So upon failure of a single drive, subsequent reads can be calculated from distributed parity such that no data is lost. So RAID 5 requires at least three disks. Okay. So again, for the types of RAID, RAID 1, mirroring. Okay. So duplicates data on one drive to another and is used for fault tolerance or mirrored volume. Okay. Now RAID 5 is basically strips data across drives and uses parity checking, data is not duplicated. Okay, so and it uses up to three or more drives or devices. Now RAID 10 or RAID 10, combinations of RAID 1 and 0 take at least four disks, but you can use two disks with that. Okay, so data is mirrored across pair of disks. Okay, now how to implement RAID? Hardware implementation, and software implementation for the RAID. Now for the hardware implementation, hardware RAID controller or RAID controller card, okay, is or should be supported by the motherboard, okay? So software implementation uses the operating system. So best RAID performance, all hard drives in an array should be identical in brand as much as possible, size, speed, and other features, okay? So if Windows is to be installed on a RAID hard drive, RAID must be implemented before Windows should be installed. Okay. All right, so how to implement hardware RAID? So you are using this um, expansion card here. Okay, so we call it the RAID controller that provides for SATA internal connectors. Right, and of course, it should have an associated driver to it. Okay, now general directions to install RAID 5 array using three matching SATA drives. First, install drives in a computer case and connect each to the motherboard. So boot the system and enter or go to the UEFI or BIOS setup. So verify drive is recognized, select the option to configure SATA and select RAID. So you can do that on a BIOS setup. Now reboot the system, okay? Press Control and I to enter the RAID configuration utility. So this will depend on the type of BIOS or UEFI you're using, okay? So select option one to create RAID volume, select RAID 5 parity, strip size value, okay? So volume size, next is create volume, right? 
so next is you could go ahead and check it on your BIOS if it is supported or if it supports uh, RAID configuration. Okay, so you can see there IDE RAID and then you've got the AHEI. So you go ahead and choose RAID. Okay, so afterwards, so you have their create RAID volume. Okay, and then you've got RAID level. So you have to choose what level you're going to implement. Okay, and then that's it. So afterwards, you can now start the installation of the operating system. Okay, so another thing for our storage is of course the external enclosures. Okay, so hard drives are sometimes stored in external enclosures or enclosures. So make it easy to expand storage capacity on a single computer or make available hard drive storage for an entire network. Okay. So some of us are using, this is an example of enclosure here for our external hard disk. But in the organization, they are using sort of network attached storage or NAS. Okay. So enclosures connect to the network via an Ethernet port. So just like a computer, you have the RJ45 connector at the back and then connect it to the switch or to the network. So hard, drive, uh, hard disk drives inside enclosures might use a SATA connection. Okay, so this NAS or the network attached storage is a file level, okay, as opposed to block level storage. So computer data storage server connected to a computer network, providing data access to heterogeneous group of clients. Okay, so like what you see here on the screen. Okay, NAS is specialized for serving files, either by its hardware, software, or configuration. So it is often manufactured as a computer appliance, a purpose built specialized computer. Okay. So NAS systems are network appliance that contain war, uh, one or more storage, often arranged into logical redundant storage containers or RAID. So network attached storage removes the responsibility of file serving from the other servers onto the network. So they typically provide access to files using network file sharing protocols such as NFS, SMB, and AFP, which is not part of this course. Okay. Now, what to know about supporting external uh, enclosures? So enclosure might contain firmware that supports RAID. Okay. Now to replace a hard drive in an enclosure, you have to refer to the documentation. So if a computer case is overheating, remove hard drives from the case and install them in an external enclosure. So it is better to leave the hard drive that contains the Windows installation in the case. Now other working files should be stored on our external storage. Okay. Next would be tape drives. So tape drives is another type of storage devices and this is primarily used for backup. Okay. So an inexpensive way of backing up a hard drive. So it is in a form of warm or write once read many. So as your data written will not be deleted or overwritten. Okay. Now the disadvantage data is stored by sequential access. And since this is sequential access, it would take time for us to access the data. Okay. So it's slow and inconvenient. Now there are two types of tapes. You've got the full size data cartridges and you've got the mini cartridges. So popular because their drives can fit into a standard three inch drive bay of a PC case. Okay. So common types of tape cartridges are the digital data storage, the linear tape open, digital linear tape, and the super digital linear tape. You also have drive one. Okay. So common types of tape cartridges. You also have the AIT or the advanced intelligent tape and SLR or the scalable linear recording. Again, the use of this tape drives and, uh, or magnetic tapes are for backup. So when selecting a tape drive, consider how many and what type of cartridges the drive can use. 
how it interfaces with a computer. So usually they are using USB, Firewire, SCSI, okay, uh, SAS, or ESATA port. Okay, so storage devices to support might include optical disks. So this is going to be obsolete, all right? You also have this uh, USB flash drives and memory cards, okay? Okay, so file systems used by storage devices. So file system are used to manage data stored on the device. Overall structure the OS uses to name, store, and organize files on a drive in Windows, each storage device is assigned a drive letter, right? You've got drive C, drive D, drive E, and so on. Okay. So next is formatting. Formatting is installing a new file system on a device. Okay. So types of file system includes NTFS, XFAT, FAT32, and FAT. Now Windows. Okay, especially the newer versions of Windows, they use as NTFS. Now for the optical drives and discs, so CD, DVD, and Blu-ray are using laser technologies. So tiny lens and bits on surface represent bits read by laser beam. So CD drives use a CDFS, or the compact disc file system, okay, or the UDF or the universal disc format file system. So the DVD and Blu-ray uses the UDF file system. Okay. So internal optical drives interfaces with a motherboard via SATA connection or for external computers or external storage, they are using eSATA firewire or USB. Okay. So data can be written to a one side of a CD. Other CDs are double sided. Okay. So double sided like DVD and Blu-ray discs. Okay. So DVD and Blu-ray discs can hold in two layers of its side. Okay. And basically it differs on their capacity. So for CD, that would be until 700 MB only. Now for DVD single side, you have 4.7. Okay. So if it is a dual layer, you've got 8.5. Okay. DVD single side dual layer. Okay, so if it is a DVD dual uh, side single layer, you've got 9.4 GB. Okay, now for the Blu-ray disc, double side dual layer could give us 50 GB of storage capacity. Okay, so next would be replacing an optical drive on a laptop. So replacing an optical drives, it could be a CD or DVD-ROM or blu-ray all right so unplug the ac adapter and remove the battery pack so remove the keyboard okay not all laptops requires this step you also have to remove the screw holding the dvd drive to the laptop and then slide the drive out of the bay and new drive into the bay okay so ensure connection with drive connector and replace the screw okay now for the solid state storage SSD hard drives, USB flash drives, and memory cards. So these are all SSD storage. Now, USB flash drives go many names, all right? So some call it flash pen drive, jump drive, thumb drive, key drive, okay? So it might work at USB 2.0 or 3.0 speed. Now, use FAT or XFAT file system, okay? So Windows 8, 7, Vista has embedded drivers to support flash drives. Okay, and so with Windows 10. All right. Next, for the memory cards, okay, so might be in use digital cameras, tablets, cell phones, MP3 players, digital camcorders, etc. All those uses this type of uh, memory cards. Okay. So SD or Secure Digital Association is responsible for the standards. And we have their 1X regular SD. Okay. And then 2X SD high capacity, or we call it the SDHC, okay? And you've got 3X SD extended capacity or the SDXC, all right? So actually, they differ in terms of 
the capacity. For the SD, that could give us up to 2 GB. Okay, for the SDHE, okay, up to 32 GB, and for the SDXC, it could give us up to 2 terabytes. Okay, now SDHE and SDXC slots are backward compatible with SD cards. So, cannot use SDHE card in SD slot or the SDXC card in an SDHE or SD slot. So, but then we do have the backward compatibility. Okay. So, next would be troubleshooting hard disk drives. So, problems caused by hard drive during the boot can cost by hard disk drive, subsystem, file system on the drive, Okay, so files required by Windows when it begins to load. And when trying to solve the problem with a boot, decide if the problem is caused by hardware or software. Okay. So common complaint, computer is running slowly. So we've got problem with the performance. So try running the defragmentation tool on the hard drive. Maybe your hard disk is full. So the Windows defragmentation tool rearranges fragments or part of files in a contiguous cluster so files are easier and faster to find. Okay. Now if your hard drive problems is during the boot up process then hardware problems usually show up at the POSD or the power on self test. Okay. So it could be due to the drive, data cable, electrical system, motherboard, or loose connection. So things to do and check before opening the case. So first, you go ahead and check the UEFI BIOS. Okay. Now check the UEFI BIOS setup for errors in the hard drive configuration. Try booting from another bootable media. Okay. So for RAID array, Use the firmware utility to check the status of each of the disk in the array and check the errors. Okay. So if the problem is still not solved, you can now go ahead and open the case, check all these things. Okay. So remove and retouch all the drive cables. So if using RAID, SATA, PATA, or SCSI controller, so remove and reset it or place it in a different slot. Receipt means you pull out and then you bring it back. Okay. Inspect drive for damage. Determine if the hard drive is snipping by listening to it. So check the cable or, or for frayed edges. Check the installation manual, smart errors. Okay, it means this data should be backed up and drive replaced as soon as possible. So what's the important thing here is, of course, our data on the desk. Okay, so use Windows tools for checking a hard drive. So check the driver manufacturer's website for the agnostic software. So move the device to a working computer and install it as a second drive. So exchange the three field replaceable units, reconnect or swap the data cable, reset or exchange the controller card, and exchange the hard drive for known good drive. Okay, so next is, what you can do is, of course, use Windows tools for checking the hard drive. Okay, check the drive manufacturer's website for the agnostic software. Move the device to a working computer and install it as a second drive. That is if you have a working computer or extra working computer on the work area. So if try these things to clean the drive and get a fresh start. So format the drive, use disk partition to start over with a fresh file system. Before you format the drive, make sure you already have backed up the data. Okay, so exchange three field replaceable units. Again, reconnect or swap data cable, receipt or exchange the controller card, exchange the hard drive for known good drive. So if your drive whines loudly, try replacing it. So a bad power supply or bad motherboard also might cause a disk boot failure. All right. So that's the end of this video lecture. Okay. So all about hard disk drives.
right? So hmm, this would be the summary. That's the end of this video lecture. Have a great day. See you on the next video.